I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. Um, we got a little role reversal here today. I'm in the studio with Dad. We got Jace on the road, which is uh, unusual. We got Zach, of course, from North Carolina. Jace, uh, can you tell us where you are? Or is this a undisclosed location? I never know how secretive you are with all of your filming and stuff. I am at an undisclosed location deep in Maryland. Ah, Maryland. So I just disclosed it. I'm on the Chesapeake Bay. Mm. Chesapeake. The Chesapeake Bay. I'd say 25 years ago, <laughs> 30. Uh, <laughs> we're, we was hunt- we're getting we on hunt- back there now. Dad. We were hunting a cypress break about 50 miles north of here. And I looked up, and here comes 35 canvasbacks. About 30 came left to right, and they lit right in front of us. And I picked out one. I couldn't kill but one back in them days. So... I raised up and boom. And since I was the retriever, when I went out there and picked that, some of them killed two or three more, but when I went out there to pick up the one that I shot, I looked at him and he had a band on his leg. Mm, jewelry. I sent the band in, the number, to the designation where, where he was banded. And we got a letter back and he said, this duck was banded 13 years ago. On the Chesapeake Bay. Hmm. Congratulations. So I put him on my years. string at the house, and he's on there out of about a you know, a couple hundred bands that I've harvested through the years. But that was one of the more uh, just think about so it. He, he made, made that trip. That, that 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 duck made that trip from Maryland up through there, Chesapeake yep. Bay. Yep. From there all the way to that to the woods down there in Louisiana. But uh, 13, just, 13 was not his lucky his number. His mistake was he <laughs> flew down, uh, back and forward, bun, 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 up and down <laughs> until he came to me. And he ended up on the table <laughs> in a pot of gravy. <laughs> <laughs> his mistake was he flew in front of the bearded one. He flew in front of the it. beard. He made a mistake. He, he, he forgot yeah. to fear the beard, Jace. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, so what Jace uh, uh, that we killed the canvas back there, 15, 20 years ago. Or 30. Maybe 30. And uh, But, Jace, what, what kind of territory is it? does it look like up there? Because that's where that duck came from. I have been really impressed. You know, for years we would do really well sending duck calls to Maryland, and I just thought, I mean, you just don't think of Maryland as a duck hunting state. But after what I've seen the last couple of days, I mean, we witnessed the migration beginning. That and Mary, so, that Mary, is that Mary, the little baby girl, the 15-year-old, is that her, or is that, uh, it's, it's, it's not, doesn't work out, Maryland, Maryland, is it some Probably Queen, Qu- Queen Mary, I would think, probably named after one of the queens, wouldn't you think, Zach? Yeah, probably. Well, we I do know out. this, you'll find this fascinating, that the state motto is no one left behind. Mm, that is a good code. I like that code. Yeah, I, I saw that. And so, you know, we've kind of had a double venture here because we're treasure hunting up here. But Maryland has an early duck season. And Whoa. so I was like, well, why don't we see if we can look into helping them get the season started? So. I talked them into it. Of course, I don't know. I can't talk about, you know, the show specifically, but I did talk them into going down, and a guy that we met was happy to let us start the season off here. And I'm going to tell you, uh, you know, the first few hours I wasn't sure, but we had a big wind shift, and you know how it is, Phil. Yep. When all of a sudden it goes from 80 degrees and tranquil to – 60 degrees and, and windy. That's a the good teal, sign. the green wing teal were on the leading edge. Whoa. Well, so, I now know, I now know being uh, from Maryland, Jace, to where we're seated right here and where this, that duck was shot 30 years ago. What, uh, what, how far is that, is that from about where you're seated? Miles. 1,500 miles, roughly. One thousand yep. five hundred miles. Yep. 
Is that amazing or what? He had the light in front of me, and I got him on the wall. Yeah, I see how it happened. So the place we're staying, obviously, I don't know if you can see the water. Did the the teal start when the wind started? The teal started. They came with the wind. Literally, they were they were the leading edge, and so they were trying to film. You know what they do? Film whatever it is. And I was like, "Hey, get down." And get what you can get, because <laughs> we're fixing to shoot this deal. <laughs> so, All of a sudden, the filming went to the background, didn't it? <laughs> I took. You, I, I just. I just couldn't help it. I was like, you know, I know we're trying to make a TV show, but y'all get in the brush. <laughs> and get what you can get because I'm fixed to shoot these teal. So it'll be interesting to see how the episode comes out because I Were did they it with little such bunches or 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 just uh, small groups. Well, here's what was funny uh, that you that you asked that it was little bunches. Of course, it's it's me and Jep who are you know seasoned hunters, and then we had Murray who actually was one of the guys who invented the mojo decoy with the flapping wings they took the concept from california of just having a rotary movement that imitates wings of ducks that flicker and they they turned it into a duck and look everybody knows that took off about like our duck call yep and uh, but he hadn't duck hunted in 30 years so uh he was a little slow on the draw but we finally you know, let him let him have his crack at him. But it started off little bunches, and when we were done and heading toward the the camp, then I just noticed on the horizon it was big bunches of oh, green yeah. wing tail. Good, right. ain't no telling so, what you'd have seen. Yeah, if you'd have been there a while, it was very so exciting. I, I mean, very seldom do you see the day the migration goes into full force. So it probably hasn't trickled down into Louisiana yet, but for Maryland, it was an exciting day. When we got back to the camp, because so, they, they have other hunters and people out, they hadn't really done well, but they had all got into them the same day that we did. So it was pretty exciting. Yeah, no, that's, boy, that's that's a pretty good TV show you're making there, boy. <laughs> that. Dad may watch that episode, Jay. Well, who knows if they got it. We'll see. But uh, it's hard to film ducks. I mean, Mm. we all know that. But I'll tell you this. Now, we grilled those things, and they were absolutely spectacular. There there was zero gaminess in in these two. I don't know if it's what they're eating. They probably were fat, and they just started their southern trip. So they probably, you know, they're just now, uh, by the way, People for years, for, for hundreds of years, have tried to figure out why waterfowl makes these journeys all the way down 1,500 miles in the case of those teal. And, and they end up in front of us down here in Louisiana, and a lot of them come from a long way. They've always wondered, all the, the people who study these things, that uh, why do ducks migrate, all these ducks and stuff that migrate, it makes for a wonderful world. But uh, What do you call it, the great protein uh, flight? Or so I used to have a, Dad used to have a name for it, about all this protein. That, flying protein. Flying protein that the Almighty sends from Canada down yep. <laughs> to Mexico. It's a pretty interesting way of looking at it. It really is. We lathered them up with a little cream cheese. We had a jalapeno. We had some... Mm-hmm. Some Cajun seasoning, and oh, uh, yeah. they melted. Some bacon? They melted. Did you put bacon on it? Oh, yeah, wrapped in bacon. Y'all got, crazy? Y'all got yeah. a good meal out of that. Could, uh, these people in Maryland, they pretty well sound like me. They know know what's, what's going on. <laughs> you, you know what I found fascinating is the group of people that we're running with in Maryland here, they act and talk just like Cajuns. And so I told them that, and they were like, well, they didn't even know what a Cajun was. And I said, trust me, somewhere in there, y'all left South Louisiana and got up here way back in your history and nobody told you about it. Because that, that's just what they reminded me of. Who knows? The women up there may pick ducks like they do in Louisiana. I don't know. Yeah, they said, hey, you want to cook them? And I said, let's, let's go with that. I mean, I think it was the, the easiest the easiest way. So they don't want me talking about the treasures we found. I mean, look, it was a home run on both lines because treasure comes in various forms you know you have ducks which got us 
just all riled up in a good way. And even Jep, it's about as excited as I've seen Jep. And uh, I was really surprised at how well he shot because the wind was 30, 40 miles an hour. It was hard shooting, but I, th- I thought we performed pretty well. All them but, years, uh, we didn't think he was, was hitting them. He was hitting them, maybe. <laughs> hey, now we knew. You know, when, I'll, I'll tell you this. When you get on an island and you're the only one shooting, that's where the real – shotgunning skills come yeah. out and uh jeff performed admirably I, I was i was pleasantly surprised yeah on the treasure hunting we we uh you know i'm not going to disclose any details because we'll save that but uh i found a penny which you'll never figure this out so this is like a riddle but i found a penny worth a thousand dollars whoa how do you do that I don't know, but we're in the wrong line of work, me and old, uh, old Al here. <laughs> That's right. We're we're uh, we're not we're not doing that well. That's pretty good, Jeff. Yeah. So I found this, and I was doing research because I wasn't familiar with this penny. And Jeff was, uh, you know, we were trying to figure out what this was. And the first thing I saw was that it was worth a thousand dollars. So we went nuts. So it's been a it's been a good trip so we're going to do a part two or you know just maybe another episode so that's why i'm still here we didn't come back home after the episode we're going to film another one it was so good we just couldn't leave well that's kudos for maryland so did zach did you look up who maryland's named after no i just thought maybe some some little chick named mary uh looks like maybe yeah, somebody from the 1600s here. I was trying Let to find it. Let me see here. So while you're looking at that, uh, I looked it Queen up. Hen- Queen Queen Mary. Queen I was. Hen- yeah, yeah, Queen Mary. You were correct. I was correct. But I want to point out one thing that that Jace brought up. That anytime you you have a an ingredient, any type of meat, doesn't matter what it is. If you put it in jalapeno with cream cheese and bacon, it doesn't. It, it's going to be good. <laughs> That's right. It definitely I mean, takes the stock up. <laughs> yeah, it's like you like like when people say, "Yeah, oh, I'll tell you how to cook them, those ducks, man. I'll tell you how to make them good." You, you you get a jalapeno, you put the little duck strip in there, put some cream cheese, and wrap it in bacon and grill it. And that I'm like, but it doesn't matter what you put in; it's going to be good, <laughs> right? I don't know. There may be a couple of the uh, coot or a couple of things that you you still might have to have trouble with, even with that combination. But you're right; that has a lot to do with it. Also, Maryland is one thousand miles. Uh, the Chesapeake Bay is a thousand miles from here, Dad. So thousand miles. I was a little bit off, but yeah, a thousand miles. So just mm. a correction in podcast. Would Let's, you say that real quick? That's, that's a, a long, long way. A long way for birds to. Yeah, it's a thousand, long way. A thousand miles. Let's uh, let's take our first break. So, like most uh, Americans, you kind of start getting toward the end of a year. You start looking ahead to next year. Things you need to to work on. Things you need to look out for your family. Uh, one of the things that Lisa and I have done uh, is we have uh, signed up with Samaritan Ministries, um, which is uh, really a Christian community way of uh, dealing with your medical bills and. Uh, we're excited about it. We just were brand new, um, so uh, hadn't tested the waters yet, but we feel uh, very assured by being with them. If you have a medical need, uh, you have fellow members that are going to send money directly to you to help you pay your medical bills. You'll do the same for someone else, and also you'll pray for them, uh, and it's an encouragement. There's no networks, which puts you in full control of your family's health care You know what's best for them, so you choose the doctors and hospitals you go to, and you have a say in the treatments that they receive. You can join today, um, start healthcare sharing with Samaritan Ministries the day you complete your membership application, or you can choose what month you'd like to start. It's totally up to you. This is not insurance. It's assurance that you're part of a health care sharing community. Samaritan Ministries is a biblical solution to health care where we can bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. Whether it's a broken bone, unexpected diagnosis, or other medical emergency, you'll find comfort knowing you're connected to 80,000 Christian households across the nation who stand ready to care for one another spiritually and financially during a time that is needed the most. Become part of this community today at SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash unashamed. Sign up today. So, uh, Zach, you got a, uh, we need to have a blind update cause we hadn't talked about it in a few podcasts, but I know, 
Um, it's still in some places because I was just up in Illinois and some other places, and they still had it in the theater. Um, I don't know if it'll still be there by the time this airs, but t- tell us a, a little bit about what's going on with the blind. I know, are we not the now the highest grossing Fathom event ever? Did did I did I catch that? Yeah, somewhere? we is that, are. Is that yeah, correct? we, we passed the chosen. The, yeah, that was a big deal, right? I mean, yeah. we, it's the highest. Yeah, they, this is we're the number one Fathom film, at least for now. Uh, so that was one of our uh, our goals. Uh, I'm looking up. I think I have dates. I'm just trying to find this here, Al. I have dates, official dates, when you can watch the blind movie at home. It is still in theaters, so yeah. you can go out and watch it at the theaters. But it's going to be able to buy. You'll be able to buy it on uh, digital, which is like your. Um, they call it Peabody. You know, when you're on your streaming whatever amazon or whatever download, you buy right? stuff at. yeah you can do a digital download on november 3rd yep. and then we'll have it on dvd and blu-ray on november 14th but here's the deal you can pre-order right now on walmart.com amazon um so i love this because we've got man i was thinking about how this is i think this is what's going to happen there in christmas i mean there's been so many i mean it's thousands of people thousands and thousands of, of messages that we've got of how impactful this film was so but um if you got somebody that maybe you couldn't get to the theater that'd be good a good christmas present for you to get them as uh the blind dvd um so you got that november 3rd is the is uh the digital november 14th is the dvd so yeah, and kinda... I know a lot of people are probably going to get it that way because um, it just didn't show it. Like, there's a lot of our listeners in Canada. We have a ton of listeners in Canada, and they, I kept getting emails and messages on yeah. Twitter saying, "When's it coming to Canada?" Although I did meet a guy yesterday that was a church dad from Ottawa, no yep. on, Ontario, Ontario, Ontario. Yeah. I and, saw uh, him. Yeah, and he said that uh, he they watched it in the theater, so it did make it to wherever Ontario. Yeah, we had actually it's weird because we yeah we didn't we weren't in Canada, but then we, we I mean we were, I, I didn't realize how many uh, fans were up in Canada. There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people that listen to Canada. Yeah, watch Duck Dynasty and follow the family um, in Canada. So we um, just honestly because of the sheer demand that we got we were able to go into some of the uh, distributors up there and, um, and it did really well in Canada, matter of fact. And so, but you know, it's not everywhere. And like this rural places we talked about, you can still have it in your church too. So if you have, um, if you get, or you, if you guys are in a, like an area that doesn't have a theater or whatever, you can have it in your church. Um, you just go to the blind movie.com. There's a little tab in there that says bring to my church. So, I mean, yeah, it's still going really well. I mean, that's been, it's been fun. Yeah, I, I can't think of a better if you're looking like for some kind of, you know, evangelism night or night outreach night for a community, especially if you got a lot of hunters and people in your area that may not come to a normal service, I think they would come if you showed the movie. I mean, I just think that's a, a brilliant idea as a way to outreach because the stories I've been getting dad have just been incredible about life change. I mean, right there in the theater and people just crying, sitting there crying and their eyes out and saying, you know what? I need to get my life right. It's just whatever it's worth. I've the, the baptism rate is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> that's right. In my little class we're, there. That, we're seeing that locally. Aren't we, that's, that's White's Ferry Road, nine o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. Every Sunday so, dad's there. You, you want to about? look an, a little inside into the movie there. There it is. That's right. The real deal. I mean, we had a bunch of baptisms at our church a few weeks ago, and then last weekend, Willie and Corey came in and did an event at the children's home with, with uh, Shane and Shane. Uh, I did throw Jason under the bus in front of about 3,000 people. All right. I did, well, Jason. Yeah. I got to t- confess. T- can you tell us what you said? Let's hear I, it. Yeah, Let me defend I, myself. I, I, I said... <laughs> I said, my family doesn't come to visit often. I said, the last time I had a family member from the Robertson side visit, and now I'm, I'm excluding you from this because you, you've been very kind. I said, Jace comes by, and Jay, so Willie's sitting on stage with me. He's here. We're, you know, we're locking arms here. I said, Jace's mode of visiting, and I told him the story of you doing the drive-by Black Mountain calling me about 1030. <laughs> hey, honk the horn. I just want to let you know I'm coming through town. Well, you, didn't you, stop, you, so. you left out one part. I honked. Well, you did. I drove by and I waved. <laughs> the wave was, hey, 
That's it. Yeah. <laughs> it actually, you know what? It actually meant a lot to me. I mean, that's the, 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 I mean, I threw you under the bus, but between me and you, uh, I mean, I would, that, that surprised me. I felt like you had gone the extra mile. If I'd have yeah, driven yeah. by and no horn blow and no wave. Okay. Then we got a problem, but I acknowledged it. And just you so didn't. the audience knows, it's cause I've been there so many times. So he honked from interstate, which is about five miles from where Zach actually lives. So if in your mind you're thinking he went by his house, incorrect. It, it was he was on I twenty six there and just honked on his way by. So if you would if you would have gassed up in Black Mountain, I'd, I would have driven up there and I would have at least come giving you a hug. The, and, the movie and, didn't get it, but it was kind of built in that out of the next forty years. I would be the one that shows up, have what a sinful life, and the power of God to get you out of it. Uh, the, the marching orders we were, were given in the Bible is he said to them, Jesus, go into all the world. This is Jesus talking, the one I had rejected for 28 years. And finally I acquiesced. Go into all the world. That's that's a big place and preach the good news to all creation. There's the gospel that he, he had died for us, was buried and raised from the dead. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. So your life is either immortal or you didn't make the cut. So I would just tell the audience here today in the podcast Put your faith in Look around at the world right now and you say, it's pretty, boy, worldwide. There's a lot of murder, mayhem, sin, death. It's, 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 it's rough out there. You can get, go through it all. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. So now that's what we're doing here at the podcast and other things. Point, point you to Jesus, it's about all we can do, and say, what have you got to lose and you got everything to gain? Yeah. No, that's well, I reject it, but America has rejected him, and the people you see in all these wars right now we're warring against, they said, no. Yeah. There's no Jesus with them. No, and it's, that you're right, Dad. It's important that all of us you know, be in tune with the message. Uh, I told a story yesterday. I preached yesterday here at WFR, and, I don't know that I've ever preached a sermon on legalism, but that's the beautiful thing about when you preach through a text. It was an excellent sermon. So you get there, right? You know, so back remember back in Luke eleven and twelve, whenever the woes to you know to the legalists. So that was my sermon topic yesterday. And uh, but I told a story in there, and I was telling Dad this morning uh, before we came on air that it was it reminded me a lot of the story Dad tells about giving the fish to the people that were stealing from him. And then they quit stealing from him. We were at an event and we were in uh, Champaign, Illinois. So we're on a campus, the campus of uh, Illinois university. And uh, so, you know, we're in the blue state, you know, in terms of how they rank things in terms of pol politically speaking. So I told Lisa, I said, we might have some protesters tonight. Cause you know, we're on a, usually when I get near a college campus with, for a pro-life event, you know, there'll be some kids that'll show up to protest. And sure enough, we were we were crossing over to speak to another room because this event was so big, they had like 300 more people in a room that wasn't in the main room. So we went over to meet them, and I told them a couple of bonus stories, you know, since they were kind of on the outside. And we saw these protesters. I had the matching shirts, and they had the signs, and they were being respectful, but they were out, just outside the door. And uh, But this director that was with us, she said, uh, you guys go ahead and go over and, and speak. I'm going to step outside and speak to these folks. And I thought, hmm, that's bold. So we kept going. She walked outside. After we were finished, when I came back out, they were gone. And we were only in there 10 or 15 minutes. And so I, so the woman wasn't with us, and this other one was there. So what, well, so what happened with, the, with her and the protesters? And she said, you know, she went out, and she said she welcomed them, and she said, I'm the director of the pregnancy center that we're raising funds for tonight, and you know, I just want to thank you kids for being active and involved and exercising your First Amendment rights and doing it. You, you've been very kind and, you know, you haven't been ugly to us. And I just want to say thank you for that. And and if anybody ever needs our services, you know, here's our address and we'd always love to be there for you. And so I just I just wish you guys a good night. And uh, then she came back in and then 10 minutes later, <laughs> they were gone. And so it's like, 
I mean, I don't know that it was maybe they were going to leave anyway, but I don't know if that's the old deal about when you show love to people, you know, that may not agree with you. It's never a bad way to go. I mean, so I told that I got up in front of the audience that night. And first thing I said was when Scott Van Pelt starts Sports Center, he says, let me tell you the best thing I saw today. And so then I told that. Of course, then she got a standing ovation from the people inside. I was like, that, that's how you handle it. You're unashamed. You're bold, but at the same time, you're loving. I mean, that's what Jesus was, so I thought it was pretty good. Let's let's take another break. So one of the things that I used to always look forward to was my box of awesome coming from uh, one of our sponsors, Bespoke Post. But apparently, someone has rerouted my boxes to North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> And now, Who would do that? and now my excitement has just continued to build because I have got no packages yeah. laid. But apparently, Zach, you have. So why don't you tell the folks out there what uh, what you've gotten lately from a box of awesome? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm trying to get to the bottom of that. I'm going to find out who did that. <laughs> yeah, you, you've been will, working on it for months now, but yeah, keep working on it. They will be reprimanded, but I will <laughs> tell you, rest assured that I did receive uh, another knife, which you can never have too many knives. Mm. So I got a. Um, a, a foldable knife um, from a box of awesome. So yeah, I, I love the stuff I get from those it's guys. Fantastic. You, it's fantastic. It's a, it's incredible. Anything from knives, as he said, camping gear, essentials, uh, cozy threads, maybe some uh, cock- thermoses. I've got an awesome thermos yep. from there that I use every time I go camping, uh, put my coffee in anytime I go outdoors. Yeah. So if you want to get started, check these guys out. It's a lot of fun. Um, you're going to go to box of awesome.com. You're going to take a quiz. That's going to help uh, them make sure you get the right stuff. Uh, they release new boxes every month across a lot of different categories. Each box is valued at around $70, but you're only paying a fraction of that. And you're also supporting small businesses with Box of Awesome. We love that. 90% of everything that comes in your Box of Awesome is from a small upcoming brand, which we love. It's free to sign up. You can skip a month or cancel any time. You get 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up at boxofawesome.com. Enter the code Phil at checkout. That's boxofawesome.com. Use the code Phil for 20% off your first box. Boxofawesome.com. Code Phil. Sign up today. I got a, a on Twitter. There was a I responded to a guy. One of our listeners took a picture, Jace, of our set here. And, in, and me, you, and Dad were here, and it said three men, one gospel, and five pairs of glasses. Huh. That's what the caption said on the thing. And so he was talking about this, all these glasses. <laughs> yeah, there's a collection there <laughs> in front hey, of what that. What is that? Why do y'all got so? In case one of them breaks, or what's well, the? What's well, the... this, these are mine. These are mine because yeah. I don't wear them because I I don't need them up close. But these are all Dad, so I don't know. Dad, I oh, just—they're all there to make people think. Boy, look, <laughs> look, look how many pairs of glasses he got. He must be really smart. <laughs> and they hear me, and they said, "Nope." <laughs> but I've never seen. <laughs> <laughs> I just it's thought that was very set, clever. Dad. Three set, men, set one gospel, five pairs of glasses. I thought that was yeah, pretty clever. Good. So whoever that no, was. What's happening is, so Phil brings a pair of glasses. Then he goes back home and says, what happened to those glasses? <laughs> yeah, and so Kay buys him another pair, and then he brings them up to the Look, Maddie table. pointed out there's two more pairs <laughs> behind us on the shelf back here. So. You got to remember the blind. So there are some <laughs> that need heavy duty pairs of glasses to see. Hey, what be careful! Hey, be careful! Because I got I got chastised on uh, on my Instagram. I got a message from a lady. I I never responded to her, but she said, uh, "What did she accuse me of for titling it the blind? What was the? Oh, it was ableism." Which, by uh, the way, my my dad's sister is blind, and. Uh, I didn't know that was a thing because she's never complained about the title of the movie. But um, she said, you're you're assuming or you're equating blindness with ignorance and that's ableism or, or something. I, and I never responded to her, but I was thinking, well, how do you know that's what we meant? And I, you know, cause we, it, there it's is not the what thing. we meant. <laughs> yes. It's the duck line too. Like yeah. you're assuming that we're meaning that, which actually shows that you're, you know, guilty of, of uh, ableism or whatever that means. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting. Isn't ableism like 
uh, being anti old people? I, I think know. she's saying I, I you're, that's, or against disabled you're, you're assuming or like basically you have this ability and then you're assuming that someone who doesn't have this ability is, I, I couldn't quite understand what she was getting at, but, um, but you're going to, I mean, look, I told my kids this, no matter what you do, you're, you're always going to, you're always going to upset somebody probably, but ableism is here's the, so here's the definition. Dis- discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. So that's that's the actual definition. So you, if you're having eye problems, you would be taking advantage of him because. So you're discriminating. Her argument is you're discriminating against me because I'm blind because you. No, named she it. wasn't blind. Oh, but she was a same, somebody else. But, I yeah, guess. I don't know. How, yeah, we did. But well, I just the problem with that is we, this: uh, the 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 whole spiritual definition that we talk about all the time in the Bible about blind has nothing to do with actual physical eyesight. So uh, that's incorrect right off the bat, because that's a whole nother genre of being blind. I think that's what she's saying, that you're equating it. You're using this term. Well, Jesus did it first, so. Yeah. I mean, we're in good company. I mean, yeah, well, well, she did it when she assumed that's what we meant, which it is what we meant. I mean, it was double entendre, right? So, I mean, it is, but... But I never said I never told her that, so she had to assume that. Oh, so she which, has a problem. She had a problem with just the the term the blind the blind. Well, not yeah, how the we use just the idea. But I got you. I got you. We're using what Jesus said uh, in uh, Luke, the last chapter of Luke. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. That we do. Yep. We would show yeah. them what the scriptures say. This is what is written. Mm-hmm. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Man, what a... You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. It's talking about the Spirit. But stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So they were... Jesus told them, just tell them that I've, I'm God. I've come to what the earth. I, they, they kill me. But three days later, I rose from the dead. I am your ticket out of here. I mean, basically is what he said. And we give that to people, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. No. It's not blind. It's open your eyes when right. you when you get that message. Well, I was thinking about the, on the road to Emmaus. Remember when he was walking, in the, and it said, and their eyes were open, and suddenly they could see who he really was? There's I mean, a big difference before I come to Jesus and, and now— it's been 40 years after I came to him. I'm way better now than I was when I started, Al. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> w- would you say you were blind? Uh, oh, and, and you saw? Blind as a bat. Yeah, that's exactly right. No, I think that's a good term, Zach. We should keep using it. In all deference to this to the person, um, I think I, th- I don't think they're right about that. Me either. I think you're right on target. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about loot. Um, we got... Um, I think we left off in 17. Um, Zach, I don't know if you were with us the last time. We went through this, uh, I called them kingdom essentials. I mean, everybody has their own way to outline stuff. But in this whole chapter of 17, I see these as being essential things that Jesus is trying to teach the disciples. Because remember, we were coming out of that really pretty harsh text in chapter 16, where he had this vision of this story he was telling about heaven and hell or the idea of it. And I mean, it's, you know, serious stuff that he's talking about here. So he comes back he starts teaching his disciples this. And so out of that, he talked about their influence and their relationships and the idea, I think the way Jace put it was to not offend, but to be unoffendable, which I thought was a pretty good way of putting it. Was that what you said, Jace? To, you want to live in a way to not offend, but also to be unoffendable, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah, because he started off in the first paragraph of Luke 17 saying, you know, don't cause people to stumble. And so you don't want to offend. And, and that, that phrase is used a lot when it's dealing with children. Right. But when it says it, it in verse two, where it says it'd be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck. Mm-hmm. than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. So we, you know, by our life, we don't want to offend, but also 
when someone offends you, because then he makes that transition. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him, which is a way more, you know, it's just, I don't know about way more, but it's, it's difficult to forgive. And then you got into this, well, how many times do I forgive? And yep. so the apostles concluded that they needed an increase of faith <laughs> because it's very hard not to call someone to sin. And then it's really hard when someone does something to you to forgive. I mean, I think that's what Al meant by, you know, yeah. hard teaching. Yeah. It, it, it's just this, this is really what people struggle with more than anything on the planet. No. And, uh, but he kind of gives us the recipe, which is another hard teaching, which is he's basically saying, I own everything. You're, you're servants, and yeah. you're unworthy to start dictating policy. And so that was kind of the thrust of the basis for forgiving. And you realize that Jesus became a servant to forgive us. He humbled himself. He came here to save and look at the injustice that happened to him. The, you know, to say that he was offended against is an understatement. And yet he chose to forgive. So that's our, our basis for having the power, which is his power, to forgive others. So, Dad, we've seen uh, your videos get censored a few times in the past. Uh, you had one a few years ago where you were plucking a duck, and they called it animal cruelty, even though the duck was already dead. <laughs> so uh, the tech companies can shut you down any time over the silliest... A lot of feathers flying in every direction just to meet the world's food stuff. <laughs> That's exactly right. You got to plug them somewhere, don't you? <laughs> so these tech companies can shut you down anytime over the silliest things. The folks over at Blaze have always let us say whatever we want on any of Dad's shows. And now they've launched another way to deliver content that won't get canceled or demonetized. If you go to theblaze.com right now, you'll see they've redesigned Blaze News. They've got news, opinion, analysis, lifestyle, sports, and tech commentary. But what you won't get are those annoying ads you see on other websites. All they're asking is if you find their work valuable, visit theblaze.com and subscribe to Blaze News. It's less than the cost of a cup of coffee a month to cut out the ads and invest directly in their news and commentary. If you're already a Blaze TV subscriber, the new ad-free Blaze News will be included with your Blaze TV subscription, along with Unashamed and 800 episodes of In the Woods with Phil. So check out the new site at theblaze.com. He illustrated that teaching, uh, Luke does, when he then gives us this story about these 10 lepers who were healed. And you remember out of the 10, one of them was a Samaritan and the other nine were not. But the Samaritan is the one who uh, recognized, you know, just how powerful Jesus was in this moment. So he comes back to praise him. And and I love what you said, Jason. I don't know if it came from uh, Keller or somewhere, because uh, I don't know if you thought of it or they did, somebody else did. But you told the story about that I never thought of, that he would he he couldn't go to the priest and show himself in Jerusalem because he was a Samaritan. So he'd had to go back to Samaria to be able to do that. And so he, in in essence, he recognized who the true priest was. And I love that. I I've never put that together, but that's brilliant because that's probably exactly what made it so special is that he recognized the true high priest. Yeah, I got that. Because I got that. The high priest, Kel- all the prior high priests had gotten together as a unit and and was giving him a lot of difficulty. That's right, and he still and Jesus shows his, who he is because he still sent them him the through law, the process. The, 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 the ones you're talking about, yeah, you know, it's about three different groups. Oh yeah, teachers of the law, the Pharisees. Yep. Where did you get it, Jay? Yeah, I got it from Keller, and I and I do think that that is the point because when you think about it, when Jesus told him to go show yourself to the priest, well, he was going to have to go a long way. But somehow he figured out, because this was an incurable disease yep. from their perspective, and he concluded what the Hebrew writer said in chapter 7, that Jesus became our priest not on the basis of a regulation or some kind of ritualistic thing, but 
on the basis of an indestructible life. Because part of being indestructible is if you have the power to cure a disease without any kind of medical procedures, but just at the snap of your fingers, he, he figured it out. Yep. He thought this is the high priest right here. And that's what caused him to go back and thank him, which is really a beautiful picture of, of what we have in Christ and why God came down going back to the Luke 15, why he was eating with tax collectors and sinners and why he reached out to those who were viewed as not powerful, you know, the lepers and people from different countries and who looked different and the blind and the lame. Cause in this culture, these were all results of what they incorrectly believe were because things haven't gone your way. God is not in favor of you. And Jesus flipped that on its head. He showed a love for everybody and he showed a power to transform everybody. Even, even the blind man that we talked about, you know, there was a double meaning there. He, not only did he not address who caused this because he had been blind from birth in John nine, but he actually showed the power by healing him physically, but he also enlightened him spiritually so that he could recognize Jesus as the son of God. Yeah. And, and there's another vein. I think in this too, that, and I think this is from the very beginning of the scriptures in, in Genesis one, you know, a lot of theologians say that that initial garden was like a temple. And the idea was to take God's presence, which manifests in a temple. And then, and then he said, you go subdue the earth, you know, go, go expand this beyond the borders. And so, you, you go through all the prophets, all the patriarchs, all that. What, you see this vein in Scripture, even, the, even in the Old Testament, which is supposed to be right, this about God's chosen people, Israel. But then you hear all this language about the nations coming, like in Isaiah chapter 2, it's about the nations that are flowing uphill towards Mount Zion to worship the Lord, all nations, not just Israel, but all the nations. And so one of the things Jesus is doing here, too, is he's he's disrupting the the what they thought of of the temple what they thought of God who is God's chosen people for example and and it's pretty clear that he's opening this up to everybody to the untouchables to those with leprosy to the samaritans to the gentiles eventually and when we see the acts you know the you guys uh I've, I've sat in a lot of y'all's talks where y'all have talked about jokingly you've talked about you know uh killing animals and you, and y'all reference acts chapter 10 when the sheet comes down with all the animals on it and 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 the command was arise, kill and eat. And y'all's joke is, you know, you're just following commands of the Almighty. But there's actually another really significant point in Acts 10, which is don't call something unclean that I've called clean. And so there's this idea that Christ, through Christ, all the nations are being called up into community, into this this new temple, with Christ being the cornerstone of that temple, and then us, the people of Christ, the church are built on him as living stones. And so it's, I don't think it's an accident that he moves directly into the teaching about the kingdom in, uh, in verse uh, 20, uh, what is it? Verse 20, right after this whole cleanses the 10 lepers, he moves into the teaching about the, the, the kingdom. And I think that that's it. The kingdom of God is all people or all types of people, all nations being called up into this, uh, into this new temple structure um, where we can all dwell in the presence of God. Yeah, and which obviously they were having a hard time with because they couldn't see beyond the system that was already in place. Let's take our last break. Yeah, it was interesting because I, I said that I preached yesterday on legalism, and then it was in that hard passage where Jesus was. I mean, he he got after him pretty good. That was those those woes were. Where, where were you at yesterday? I was in Luke eleven when he gave the six woes. You know, he gave three to the Pharisees yeah. and then three to the experts in the law. Oh, and Jason, I used uh, I used you in an illustration yesterday um, because you know the teachers of the law. Whenever Jesus gave the first three woes, you remember they they said they spoke up and said, "Well, Lord or Rabbi, you're." You're offending us when you talk like this, you know. It was like it was like they spoke up because it's like, wait a minute, we we believe the same things you just told them. Which I was saying, what kind of idiot does that? And, and my illustration was, I said, you know, when back when I was in the discipline phase of life, and Dad was having discipline with me, if he'd have been giving me a whipping, 
And Jace would have been standing there and said, wait a minute, Dad, this is not fair that you're whipping out for this. I've been doing the same things that he did. I mean, I <laughs> yeah. said, trust me, Jace would have never done that when I said that everybody never laughed. I said, it. you know what he did? He looked away and whistled because <laughs> – you, you, don't you, don't, me. <laughs> you don't you don't want do you don't even make eye contact in that moment just in case you did something that you might get you some so i was yeah. like you know that what a what a dumb thing for them to do right but so he get he gives them these these woes and so this whole lesson was about this idea of what you just described zach the difference well here's what was interesting so yesterday we had a family that was supposed to do a baby blessing at the beginning of the service you got another baby, and it was a family that's not really at WFR, but they're related to a family that has a lot of real issues, physical issues, noticeable issues. You know when you see them, but they're I love them. They're they're faithful. They're wonderful people. But if you just looked at them, you say, "Man, what is wrong with this family?" Because they have some maladies, and so these people are related to them. Well, they ca- so they didn't. They were late. They they texted Brahmi and said, "We'll be there in twenty minutes. We're fixing to start." So Brahmi goes to me. And he says, "Can we do it at the beginning of the sermon?" I said, "Sure, whatever." So we had this baby blessing at the be- before I preached, and this family is up there, and the family that came in. I mean, the wife she has all the uh, studs and stuff. And, you know, look like as as uh, somebody said, look like she swam through a tackle box. So she's got all that going on, and then the man has all the tats, and you know, I mean, he he's a he's a he's a dude. And I just thought about it in that moment. We were all standing there. I thought, man, I'm fixing to preach a sermon about the kingdom of God and not being self centered and thinking about other people and being like Jesus, who looked at lepers and anybody that seemed to be the dregs That's of his right. society. And I thought, I, there's not a better. I couldn't say that because I would say I wouldn't want to embarrass his family, but uh, you know. I, the picture of the kingdom of God was on that stage yesterday. Yeah. And what was re- what was really interesting about it, because I was fixing to preach about it, as as this couple were holding their baby, was watching the pictures of their baby on the screen, and we were singing the song that we sing during the baby blessing, both of them just tears were pouring down their cheeks. And I just thought, man, this is it. This is what the kingdom of God is supposed to look like. Everybody's welcome at the table. Yep. And I just thought, you know, a Pharisee wouldn't have gotten within 10 miles of this family because they didn't look right to them. And that's the kind of stuff we're dealing with here. So right in this text, that's so powerful yeah. that that's there. I love that because the heart of legalism, particularly when it pertains to the kingdom, is that legalism, the goal the goal of legalism is this. Because people say, what is what is legalism? One, one definition could be it, it's trying to earn... Um, favor with God based on what you do. Like and it's like a legal code that I'm going to do the right things, and then and then I'm going to I'm going to be right with God legally. The problem is, is that you have sin, and you don't understand the gospel because you don't understand who God. God is so infinitely beyond us. Trust me when I tell you, you do not want to go before a holy God and say, "Justify me based on what I've done." Nobody wants to. No, nobody wants to say that because in, as we have all sinned. Th- that's the whole point of, of Paul's argument in Romans. For all have sinned and fallen short of his glory and are justified freely by his grace. So legalism is trying to earn the way, but how it pertains to the kingdom is that if w- w- the reason why we do that is because we want to contain God. We want to we want to box him in. And if we can if we can earn our salvation by what we do, then what that means is that we're in control. We're in control of our own destiny and our own righteousness, and we're in control of the kingdom. And that's what the Pharisees were trying to obtain. That's why they wanted to. That's why it was hard for them to see the kingdom, because in their mind, the kingdom was stuck inside of a temple somewhere that was built by Solomon, built by man's hands or built by the whoever came after that. And and it was all stuck in there. And then Jesus is coming with something totally different whenever think about whatever uh, when John the Baptist showed up, um, he says that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he and then Matthew attributes that to a, a prophecy out of Isaiah. The kingdom of God is at hand. And then Jesus, when he started his ministry, after he uh, went up to be tempted by the devil, uh, do you remember what, it, what what he said? The kingdom of God is at hand. And then, so here you have this this other phrase here in Luke, uh, what Jesus is, is here, and he says, now, uh, having been questioned by the Pharisees as to when the kingdom of God was coming, because they're thinking, when, what, when, when is it going to come? He answered them, and he said, "The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed." In other words, you can't box it in. 
nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is. It's not in a structure. It's not in a building. It's not in a temple. He says, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. I mean, that is, you got to keep in mind, that is, a, that is a shocking statement for him to say that at, in this particular point in history. Well, I think, too, you know, after what he just got through doing, picking up the two hardest things that there are to do is not causing someone else to sin and forgiving others who do sin. So he comes up with this illustration that makes people uncomfortable. There's one owner and everybody else is a servant. Well, then he segues into there's a king of the kingdom and you're not him. Yeah. He's, he's the king. You know, we all deep down want to be kings and that's what's been going on since the beginning of time. And that's why he's given this prediction of, you know, I'm the king. He, he's showing people I'm the son of man that was predicted in the book of Daniel. I, I'm the Messiah. I, I, I'm here. And so as members of the kingdom, it puts you in the perspective because they asked when, because they wanted to act like they could get ready for whenever he comes and have every, you know, all their legalistic forms yeah. of righteousness in place. And he's turning that on its head because then he goes into reminding them in the next paragraph that first he has to suffer, which is something that is not does not go along from a worldly point of view of what a king does. You know, we all think of physical kingdom. The king, he's comfortable and he would yeah. never have to suffer. And so that's why he's turning it on its head. And uh, but it's it, it's actually uh. You know, we're going to have to do a whole nother podcast on this because it's me. It's easily misunderstood on what he's referencing here. Well, it, we are going to have to do a whole nother podcast on this. But because uh, when you said that about Daniel, I, I, in the next podcast, I want to go through Daniel 2 and um, and Nebuchadnezzar's dream, because I think this is the moment. Right. I mean, this is a, this is a prophetic. This was prophesied in the Old Testament by prophet Daniel. Um, and then there's this fulfillment of it that's happening right before our eyes here. And but there, here's the point that I think is, man, we got to get this. And this is a, this is a controversial, but I do not understand why. But the kingdom of God is here. It, it, it came with the king. The kingdom of God is here. I mean, I, we we can't procrastinate the coming of the kingdom as something that's like far off. It's going to come at the end of time, at the end of the Christian age, and then the kingdom comes and we get to participate in it. That is, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches at all. I think the Bible teaches, I mean, he's clear, I mean, he says it here. But Jesus, John the Baptist said the kingdom of God is, is at hand. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand. And then here he says the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, it may not be here in its full fruition. And I, I and I would I would say that, but but there is elements of the kingdom. There, the kingdom is here, and we are participating in it as the church. I I, I don't think we that is important because if we procrastinate the coming of the kingdom, then what's going to happen is we're going to procrastinate its blessing, and then we're going to end up in some form of gnosticism where it's like, oh, it's just all what's going to happen in the future. It's all you know spiritual. This doesn't matter here. No, it does matter. What's happening right. right now matters. You're right, Zach. That may be why that the the church has been in a hole and a lot of malaise and hadn't made a lot of differences because of misunderstanding. Of There's so thing. many brands, but the brand I tell them to use when they ask, "Who are you with? What group is it?" and you just tell them, "I'm with the kingdom of God and I'm with Jesus." There you go. So we'll we'll flesh that out better uh, when we get into that text. We'll, we'll set it up a little bit in the overtime, but then we'll talk about that the next time we're all together on the podcast. Uh, if you want to follow us into our overtime segments, blazetv.com slash unashamed. So we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube. And be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.